Into the Nexus is a production of AMove.TV. Bookmark AMove TV for other great video games and esports podcasts. Into the Nexus is sponsored by listeners like you via patreon.com slash ITN. Greetings, and welcome back, everyone, to Into the Nexus, the podcast all about heroes of the storm. I'm Garrett Weinzerl, and I'm here, as always, a little earlier, though, than always, with Kyle Ferguson. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing good, man. We're getting teased, and we're sitting here on a Monday, recording early, past 11 p.m. Pacific, and I don't think we're getting a PTR today. I don't think we are either. We were totally just sitting here waiting and waiting and waiting... And uh, we decided, well, we need to get this done um, because you're about to get on a plane and go see all of your family members because you got a baby on the way and you have reveals and stuff to enjoy. Yes. Tour of Family 2019. <laughs> tour of Family 2019. Okay. You do like a, a family tour like every year, pretty much. Yeah, they're all in Florida. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not difficult. Yeah. It's, uh, it's you, you ready? Are you ready for some swamp? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been, it's been raining up here, yeah. but I'm ready for 84 I'm hearing. So a big change from our fifties. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's really nice right now, but it's supposed to be, you know, Florida by the weekend. And that's the weather, everybody. Glad you tuned in. All right. That. We did it. <laughs> Baby six matter. No. You got to pack shorts. You got to, you know, you got to change out the wardrobe. You got to get ready for end game that I'll be seeing in downtown Disney. Go to Disney world. So, uh, you know, I got stuff to look forward to. We may, uh, if the stars align, get to see each other in person because I will be in Orlando the same time you're going to be there. But, we're, you know, you're doing family stuff. I'm, well, I'm going to watch cars drift sideways at high, at high speeds. But, you know, we, we have places to be. Exactly. Rubber to inhale. <laughs> Sadly, what appears to be Anduin doesn't have places to be because he's uh, taking his sweet time. He, he does, much like, uh, well, frankly, the, the leaders of the Horden Alliance in BFA. Uh. Well, yeah, Sylvanas <laughs> gets all the heat because I guess at least Anduin's visible. Not, not as much, really, honestly. Both leaders of both factions, not very visible in this faction war expansion in World of Warcraft. Um, so maybe that's what it is. Anduin is still just uh, sitting on his throne telling Tyrande he can't help her. It's... I mean, it's the it's the sword. It's got a holy light in it because, you know, Anduin made it so. This could be, I don't know, weaponsmith master something or other, but it seems unlikely. Uh, uh, it, it's Chalamet. It is 100% yeah. Chalamet confirmed. Uh, but so. You think Anduin and Sylvanas are going to have some like choice words for each other if they end up on the, the battlefield together? Uh, I mean, at this point, man, I'm, I'm sad to say that my bet would be, so it's you. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, but, but they got to do something for Anduin and Varian. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I mean, maybe. Right. They may have known. But, you know, honestly, I don't think it's worth knocking the game about that because I see Overwatch people complaining about that. The past three expansion characters haven't had interaction lines and just goes the way. You know, these are these are human beings. You got to you got to get them in the studio. You got to get them all prepped up. Not all of them can be old Jimmy, who's got a suite set up in his own house, Robert Clotworthy and can call it in literally you know mail it over well, I mean, we, do, do, we, do we know if that's actually how we how we did it lay down all the tracks for heroes of the storm like is it well we know we, that when we interviewed from... robert clotworthy like dude that yes. was like seven years ago <laughs> yes true and he was still using a fax machine at the time but he did record from his own house and he said he did that for ancient aliens oh okay i guess that makes sense i mean yeah. uh yeah yeah it can be it can so, be done for sure, but we don't know for a fact. Is my point. Well, not, I mean, that, it, not that I think any of the fine listeners out there are going to be like, "Hey, 
you don't know for a fact Robert Kroll I'm weird they didn't come into Blizzard HQ and lay down his 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 Jim Rayner lines. But no, and then you have the people on the other side of the glass and the interaction, the dude reading it. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think that's very likely that they did do it in house. They they have I forget her name, but you know she exhibits a lot of control and that's her sphere and she has an awesome job at it. The manager of the whole voice department, Blizzard shares one. If you're not kind of familiar with their pipeline there, but I think things are going to change. You know, this is a little off the the beaten heroes path, but a big conversation happening around all video games right now. While we're staring down the infinite abyss of what MMOs might come out this year, and a lot of them are Kickstarters, crowdfunded. And then you got Fortnite over there showing off how it can be done in a more regular update, more organic kind of flow sense outside of this expansion or being fearful that you're going to alienate your audience by changing things too much. Hey, in the future, I would assume that a project like this, we would have more of a retainer system where these voice actors are not even planned in advance. You know, there, there was a, a lot of talk that they'd bring them in. They just record line after line in hopes that they would hopefully catch everything they were going to come up with. We remember hearing about Imperius years ago because there's some Imperius lines in there. Instead, I hope the future is full of pre-planning, but in a money flow sense. Mm. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> it's not something I think will come to Heroes unless it has some big, uh, I don't know, third wind. Not at all. I, I think that interactions were unique. It was something that the community was really excited for, and Blizzard tried to do it, but there ended up being a lot of babble. And at the same time, you have things like Mosh Pit or many other noises that are really important to the game and having characters interacting with each other constantly nonstop. Outside of something like you know, Left for Dead, where they can, you know, fart off because, you know, it's more team based. I guess you have competitive Left for Dead, but never reach esports levels. And I'm sure they'd probably turn their lines off if that was the case. So, I, ah, gamers are responsible. They'd ruin it anyway. Uh, but in this case, I think the, the future was upcoming. And I hope that as we progress, voice actors become just as ingrained in the projects as everything else. One can hope. Now, Kyle. Yes. We've had a lot of changes in Heroes of the Storm, uh, specifically to the size of the team. So that's most likely the reason it's taking so long for Anduin to get to us. But I I have a crazy theory. All right, tinfoil hat. Are you ready? I'm ready. What if the reason... We haven't gotten Anduin yet. Is because there are multiple people on the team that truly believe he has to have a mass res and they just can't balance it correctly. <laughs> I think there is some legitimacy to that thought process because being a paladin priest mix, and by the way, they could like break tradition release this tomorrow and this is all guesswork so congratulations the future if you're listening and, and we're all wrong but there are a lot of abilities that white main didn't touch like power word shield that could be on anduin's kit if anduin has power word shield then maybe we're staring at tassadar thinking well maybe we need to do that update first what if he has mass res or they kind of do a close version of it and give them Tyrael sanctification. You know, what do you give Tyrael then instead? I'm really curious to see this hero because when we think about what Anduin does, a lot of heroes do what Anduin do. So we need to see where he's kind of pushing things for the future and what's going to be traded out to make Anduin shine, literally. <sighs> yeah. And so along those lines, uh, Tibbles, our good, our good friend Tibbles wrote in, via the Patreon Discord, and said, what do you think of the idea of Anduin coming out as the first hero for the new support role and possibly being all about buffs, paladin hands, etc.? Could also be interesting if the long-awaited Tassadar rework came around the same time and they gave Anduin Power Word Shield. Yeah. Because uh, you got your... It's it's hard. It, it's easy to forget that Anduin's a priest because in BFA, where Anduin is has been in the spotlight more more than ever before, he's running around a plate mail wielding his father's sword. 
I remember the shock that he had a shadow form at all in Hearthstone. Same. And it's something I still forget about. Because uh, well, if, it has, if it has manifested in the actual story of World of Warcraft, I missed it. What's he? Isn't he? He's got a staff in Hearthstone, right? Uh, it's like a. I would almost call it a scepter. Let's see. Anduin oh yeah, it is more of a scepter. It's been a while since I've really like given a good look at Anduin because, sir, I have Taronda as a priest hero, and so I haven't seen Anduin in years. Well, it's also a. It's a, it's a bit of a young Anduin. Clearly, the spellcaster version. Yeah, it's almost like an AQ looking scepter or something you get from one of those Zolgarubbies. Uh. I always hoped that he would be this form so that we would have that shadow priest representation or the, maybe, you know, like like his father before him, the multi-class choice. I think coming out with a support support right now would just be really nice because I think healers are doing fine. We got great diversity. And with the new healer role in the draft, I see a lot of different healers in my games. But support is, you know, Abathur, Zarya, Lost Vikings, that could use a little bit of sprucing up. Something to show the modern way. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, as far as Xanduin's concerned in the Shadow form, like really diving deep into it in Hearthstone, a lot of that came in with the the, the Frozen Throne expansion where they we got Death Knight versions of all of the heroes. Uh, but you're, you're not wrong. He did have a Shadow form, even in base Hearthstone. So, yeah, I... Because of the fact that Chalamet is in the teaser art, I mean, this has got to right. be Battle for Azeroth and Anduin, plus the leaked visuals we've already seen, even though it was like a Nia, uh, the, the, the Mecha Stormwind more looking kind of almost like a Voltron Power Rangers uniform, Anduin, he's still wielding the sword. And we can expect him to have that sort of mix of the plate paladin priest it doesn't really matter when you get to the the heroes the the characters of world of warcraft they break basic class conventions which yeah, is, is a mixed bag in my book a, a different topic but i always kind of wanted to see the representation of your class and we moved away from that it's fine i like the idea of the hands though you know you got you got your blessings which is always pretty cool we've seen things like Blessing of the Red on Alex Straza. We talked a little bit last week about how maybe Chromie could be warped into doing a buff like that. So we have buff characters in recent memory that are newer. A Hand of Freedom is something that's on Yorel's kit, actually. She has that cleanse light version. She has, is it literally called Hand of Freedom and I just forgot? Because it's a paladin spell. Yeah, I'm checking right now because I'm pretty darn sure. And this is one that, uh, well, I mean, who's played your rail recently? Lots of people. Hand of Freedom. Yeah, 22 second cooldown. Grant an allied hero 50% movement speed oh, for three freaking, seconds. Remove all slows roots. I don't know what I was mixing up your rail and Ariel. So, yeah, if your rail has it, she's a freaking paladin. That would make sense. Uh, cool. Good to know. Good to but know. up against that gift of the Naru, up against the Aegis of Light that causes the armor on nearby allies. So you don't see it too often and rarely, I think, anyone, because it's so specific to slows and roots, is anyone being like, don't worry, I've got Yorel in my back pocket. Oh, thank you, Yorel. What a wonderful draft pick. <laughs> her, her day may come again. It may, but Yorels are passionate folk. And rarely do I see, you know, some Ragnaros being like, oh, I can change this up, no worries. Here we go. <laughs> Here comes your rel. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, blessings. That'd be fun. Yeah, they I... just mess with mana. You could do uh, wisdom, give them some mana to folk. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it's We have so many paladins already and paladin like heroes. Like, we, 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 have, we have Uther and your rel, which are just straight up wild paladins. We have Johanna, who's a crusader, yes, but basically a paladin. I really want Anduin to lean more into Priest. Yes, we have White Mane. But that's basically it, right? I really like Tibble's little hint here that, hey, if this comes alongside of Tassadar, Power Word Shield, y'all. That would yeah. be so great. And the you give you get you you can talent into it. Like I don't know. Is it still a thing? I've played Priest in so long in World of Warcraft. Can you still get the talent that makes the Power Word Shield, give them a speed boost when you put it on them? Oh, totally. Okay, totally. sweet. Rad, do that in Heroes of the Storm, just one-to-one. -one. 
it 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 would be interesting. Uh, this this tease may last an extra week. Usually they let us know by now. I mean, it was Easter Sunday, so no tweets may have flowed from the organization. Dear God, what if we have to? We, we may have to put this out later for 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 uh, <laughs> certain reasons. It's gonna stink if uh, <laughs> and when it comes out <laughs> and everyone's listening to this. Like guys, we we know. All right. Well, I guess the best thing we can do is just move on and say it's Anduin. <laughs> he's coming. Uh, we have hopes. Yep. And uh, if he's out by the time you're listening to this, hopefully you enjoyed how wrong we are or how right we are. I mean, he smashed the ground. He clearly, you know, has some emotion in him, but it it just seems weird to me. And I'm on board with you. I think that Anduin might be in the melee, smacking things with a sword. If he's got a sword, he's got to be right. Yeah. I Unless mean, it's shooting. Bolts. No, here's the thing. I'm fine with it. Like, whatever. You want to do BFA and win, that's cool. But, you know, Deckard hits things too. And it's not really his, his his jam. Yeah, good call. So All right. You could do it. You could throw him in there just because you want him to look cool, just because you want him to be running around with Chalamet, just because you, you've got the mad feels. Uh, anytime you think about Varian sacrifice, like, cool, rad, sweet. But, like, lean into the priest. No, less so the paladin. But we'll see. I mean, they may go full pallet and it might be one of the coolest things I've ever seen. And I'll be like, I don't care. This is great. We shall find out. But before we move into this week's strategy segment, let's take a quick break. Kyle, you're traveling soon. I am. You, uh, you know what you could use is some luggage. Maybe luggage that had a internal battery in it for charging your smartphone and or other devices that you may or may not be playing games on to entertain yourself. I'm a little excited about this. <laughs> well, that's I'm glad you are, because this episode of Into the Nexus is sponsored by Away Luggage, which brings you first-class luggage at a coach price. Just head on over to awaytravel.com slash nexus to check out their offerings. I, uh, I am a big fan of my Away Luggage, Kyle. I've had it uh, for, for quite a while now, a little bit over a year. And it is without a doubt, the nicest piece of luggage I have ever had. I just got mine. It's got those four, like the hover wheels and my little pregnant wife is going to be pushing it along. It's got this built in little there's a storage thingy. Oh, it, it, like with the flip, it's underneath the handle. You lift the handle and the battery hides in there. And on the inside, it's got compartments. And I, I had a booklet, and things are organized. We're both packed in one bag for our five day trip. Yeah, I, I, I love it. I love it. I love mine. I have the I have the smallest carry on that they make. Uh, it, it is perfect for like a three or four day trip. Uh, when I went to New York last year, I used it. I used it recently for Jocelyn's wedding. I absolutely love their carry-on luggage. So both their carry-on sizes, the carry-on and the aptly named bigger carry-on, come with internal batteries you can use to charge your USB-powered devices, cell phones, tablets, e-readers, e- e- whatever. I've got a, 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 a like a converter so I can charge my Switch. I don't have to rub knees with anybody in the terminal because there's... 12 people crammed around the two outlets they've got. I can go find a nice, quiet terminal that there's not even a plane at. Nobody's sitting there and just sit there, relax, and play my Pokemon, play my Hearthstone until my my phone or my Switch dies and recharge that sucker. Now, the thing I so aptly named the Swivel is the four 360-degree spinner wheels. Yes, yes. They guarantee a smoother ride, and I can guarantee that. Um, I always wanted one of these. Like, I, I had the oldest luggage for the longest time, and I wanted these because it means you can just, like, you can scoot it upright, which is just the best. You put your laptop bag on top of it. You don't have it on your shoulder. It's it's made traveling so much better. They also have a TSA-approved combination lock. They have a, rem- a removable, washable laundry bag, so you can keep your dirty clothes separate from the clean clothes. As someone who usually also has like a a, a somewhat damp uh, bathing suit at the end of almost every trip he takes, I love this thing. <laughs> so uh, big fans of it. They also come with a lifetime warranty. If anything breaks, they're gonna fix it. They'll replace it for you for life. And there's a 100-day trial. You can live with it, try it, travel with it. Instagram it if at any point you decide it is not for you you can return it for a full refund no questions asked on the top of all of this you know, what is the one thing that would be better than all of this Kyle what would it be I'm not sure <laughs> it'd be free shipping which you can get on any away order within the lower 48 states 
on top of all this, uh, you're listening to Into the Nexus. It's me, Garrett, and him, Kyle. You know this. They've got a special offer for listeners of Into the Nexus. You can get $20 off a suitcase by going to awaytravel.com slash nexus. And make sure you use the promo code nexus during checkout. Again, to get $20 off a suitcase, all you have to do is go to awaytravel.com slash nexus and use the promo code nexus during checkout. We thank them for their support. We thank you for checking out awaytravel.com slash nexus. Choose a talent. Choose a talent. Talent? Ha, that seems generous. Don't reveal our plans to our foes. I mean it. Not a word. This week's strategy is going to be all about Thrall. We teased it last week, uh, and it comes to us via a, uh, a Patreon message from our patron, Dead Center, which he sent over at uh, patreon.com slash ITN. You can also write into itncast at gmail.com, or if you have Discord hooked up to the Patreon, you are already in the Into the Nexus patron Discord, and you can drop messages in there as well. Dead Center writes in and says, I know you're going to be talking about Thrall this week. Probably my favorite hero in the game. One of the things that I think is the most underrated or unknown about Thrall is his root. I love roots. Roots are great. The second best kind of CC in the game. However, most roots take a second to set up. Arthas, Janus, Tukov, White Mane, all of these roots take some precious fractions of a second to land, even if the hero is right next to you. Not the wolf. Sure, if you're trying to snipe that Nova with a root before she runs away, it takes some time for the root to get to her, but not if Nova is right next to you. It becomes almost instant. Why does this matter? Because one of the rules of our game that is slightly in between the lines uh, that we call Heroes of the Storm uh, is roots cancel out a lot of abilities. That phoenix is trying to teleport away? Not anymore. Oh, Dibble's engaged and wants to charge your mage back into his team? Nope. The Haka is digging away? He is dead before you can even think, who's playing the Haka these days? A very Ooh. important thing to note about our favorite shaman. Thank you guys for everything you do. And Kyle, this inspired you. In general, Dead Center has been very passionate ever since I first started working on Thrall on my stream and it it came from a need for an alternative to Arthas. We were finding that in this season's meta or just in the play styles that are going on around us for now, Arthas, not the best solo tank, but it was happening a lot. So to communicate that Arthas was actually going to be my pick, but I didn't want him to solo tank, I started showing Artanis early. But Artanis gets banned sometimes. He was a pretty popular pick in my league at the start of the season. And we don't always didn't need to just throw an Arthas on there. So making my way through the weave of bruisers, trying to discover what I wanted, what was going to fulfill that same need. And even with Arthas, sometimes I was sitting there and going, you know what? Despite everything that came together in this match, despite getting that other tank, now solo lane Arthas, there's nobody to poke the back line to get that little hit on Li Ming as she runs away. So you know what? We're going to do a full-blown Death Coil build on Arthas. Woo! It, it, it's okay. Uh, it's fun. But when it's when it's the right time and you get to Death Coil and then you're kind of like, well, I'm arranged anyway. I might as well go Syndragosa. It's great. But there are very few games where that ends up being the correct move. Instead, wouldn't it be great to have Thrall on my roster and have this pokey, resilient, rootin' tootin' bruiser that can bust some tanks as well as take care of the back line without causing this confusion in the draft like Arthas does. And even to this day, anytime anyone sees a throw in the draft, they're like, whoa, well done, alpha guy. Welcome to the game. I Thanks for joining. so glad that you mentioned take care of the back line because right now, in my games, this exact moment, that seems to be the number one place we are lacking is the sense of protection for our backline. Yeah, and without, without anybody watching back there, the tanks are really grabbing onto the whole enemy team. And, and this happens so often with Muradin, with Genji's to an extent, but I, I feel like Muradin's one of the main culprits here. He'll just jump over the tank. And the tank's like, I have all the DPS. What's wrong with that? Can't you take one Muradin? Thrall can. And Thrall is great at busting Diablo. 
and all these tanks. Heck, he can do pretty well unless Arthas is full blown spec with the you know attack speed increase, even a rune tap, because the roots aren't going to stop that. Arthas has his ways around Thrall, but for the most part, you're going to be a pretty stalwart defender back there. But let's let's ignore that whole part right now because that's the part that I love about Thrall. Back when HTC was going, I thought it was so cool to see the enemy tank go deep, get some snags, Tracer runs alongside of him, but who's killing Diablo who dove that Aureole? It's Thrall. He's wrecking his face back there. How awesome. No. That is not going to teach you how to play Thrall at all. That's going to make you a horrible Thrall, thinking that you're some sort of Tychus back there. What you really need to do to get into Thrall is, and wait for it, hang on, it's not Crash Lightning. Crash Lightning is the passionate pick I've discovered that non-Thrall mains think that Thrall is amazing for. It's actually Echo of Elements. And it actually, everything we're going to talk about here of how to play Thrall works into Ancestral Wrath. And by using that as your noob baseline, you're going to figure out Thrall and you're going to succeed. And then you can get weird later on and be like, yeah, I could totally bust this tank. Oh, okay. No. So because you get, you start getting, you, you now have charges of Chain Lightning, you can quickly acquire stacks of ancestral wrath or uh, uh, which allow you to well do the ancestral wrath exactly and you're relieving a huge burden on your support because by focusing on getting stacks you're hitting your trait you're filling up your frost wolf resilience which is causing you to after five stacks get healed that's... You can also at level four, which makes this way easier. So do it. Take mana tide so you get 15 mana back, plus reduce the ability cooldowns by 0.5 seconds. So now you're chugging on self healing and you're really feeling it. Wow, man, you just friggin' sold me on Thrall. I hadn't really considered this. I've always been an Ancestral Wrath fan, but I don't think I've ever once in my entire life taken Echo of the Elements and Ancestral Wrath in the same game. It makes so much more sense when you do. Crash Lightning is great if you, you know, you end up on Volskaya. Pretty good chance you're going to get this darn thing done. You end up with some guy who, you know, is like, I'm Asmodan, Praxis, throw your bottom, and you go, cool, sweet. I, I, I have the versatility to do this. But I think everyone would rather Thrall be happy to go take that solo lane because it's such an underfilled role in the first place. So Echo of Elements, you have to land killing blows, basically, with a little wiggle room on lane minions. You should have this done by level four. It is very easy to do. A cursed Hollow, you know, kind of a baseline here. First objective, probably ain't happening. But by the time you get to that sec second objective, you can very easily bust this out. And you can prep the lane. You can Asmodan it where you run in. You go a one hit, a two hit to the archers, and then do the, uh, all archers get two hits. And then the mage, I give you one hit, and... You, and the, I mean, the meanwhile, the knights in front are taking damage from the collapse and the archers, and they start to get ready to die. That's putting you past the middle point, exposing you to ganks. Honestly, I get this thing done regularly, level six, just popping at a distance. That is awesome. So now you're sitting on two charges, all right? Let's think about the next level here because you're you're going to go to ancestral wrath ancestral wrath is a very old talent it used to be called blood for blood and kerrigan and all sorts of weird heroes had this thing yeah now it, it's been, it was like this instant it was an extra button you hit it you deal damage to them you get some of that damage back as health so they changed it a while ago to make it unique to thrall so every time that you complete a Frost Wolf Resilience and get that heal and a little bit of mana thanks to your level 4 talent, you gain a stack of Ancestral Wrath. Yeah, which, getting, which, which can be a little confusing if you've never used it before, right? Because you're getting stacks off of another stack-based mechanic. Right, so just think that you're farming 8 stacks. And every time you are not in a fight, you are actively farming this because Frost Wolf Resilience stacks on enemies. Enemies hit, no less. So you know what? Two casts of Echo of Elements bouncing along. Those are all stacks building into an Ancestral Wrath. But here's the part where my mind was really blown. Feral Spirit. When it charges through the whole enemy lane and does no roots at all and looks kind of lackluster and no real damage. 
Those are all stacks. So you fire it through you. You're clearing a lane. You just pointless wolf. You would think, but meanwhile, every wolf, every enemy that wolf comes in contact with, is giving you those stacks that are building up these ancestral stacks to your eight. There is no reason any curse, any objective, you shouldn't already have an ancestral wrath stacked up and ready to go. Okay, now are you ready to defend yourself, good sir? Okay. Yes. You, do you have you forgotten yourself? No. Yes, you are Kyle Ferguson. You are the the bane of quests, the anti quester, the most anti quest person I know. And here you are talking about throwing wolves willy nilly down lanes of minions. True, but you're the solo laner, and there doesn't have to be anyone there to interact with. So the fact that you have taken mana tide that gives you mana back for every time you hit one of these frost wolf resiliences, you're kind of breaking even, and you're not randomly having to root Muradin in the early game. It, you're not so interrupting because... anybody's play style. You're not really doing anything foolish. Gotcha. So because the question, so. Echo of Elements is actually the only technical quest here, but continuing to find your eight stacks of Ancestral Wrath so you can actually use your level seven talent that you took, you more or less have to quest just by procking your trait. Exactly. So, yeah. So it falls in the line of, of healthy questing for you because you're, all, you're doing what you're already, you already signed up to do by picking Thrall. Exactly. Yeah. You're, you're being an efficient solo laner. You're clearing that lane a little fast. You've got places to be. You're you're past level one. You're not trying to you know do some war of attrition, trying to let the minions collapse into you. No, you're just clearing a lane because you want to get back to that thing. You want to go help with a mercenary. Very nice. It's also important to note here that while they are just auto attacks, your wind fury counts for stacks as well. So all three of those specialty animation hits you're doing will also factor into frost wolf resilience which flows into ancestral wrath so ancestral wrath you you could you get a button you get a one button you consume all these stacks eight stacks and deal 15 percent maximum health damage over three seconds to the enemy and heal yourself for a hundred and fifty percent of that damage dealt so obviously it should, should go into a tank that feels pretty good now granted you know sometimes tracer Runs in on you. There's no healers in range. Giving her some poison damage might freak her out or just kill her. And there's nothing wrong with just unloading 15% on her face and saying, get out of here or die. Those are fine. But if you're looking for the heal, you're dropping this on an enemy tank. It's also a great follow-up to protecting the back line like we were talking about earlier, right? Like if you're just trying, exactly. like, did you catch them with your wolf? Do you want to make sure they die? This helps a lot. Exactly. You hit them as they immediately go in that very first Volskaya objective. They dive on in. By the way, this is a heroic target that gets this 15% maximum health, so it works on vehicles. I've tried it on the uh, Volskaya robot, the dragon on Dragonshire. That's nasty. Yeah, pretty that's, cool. That's a lot of healing. And for the most part, what you want to be doing here in an ideal ahead or healthy game is you throw it on that Diablo who dove deep, and then you're just running past him. You know, you might throw back a root and be like, don't go anywhere, Diablo, while Rain well, Rainer's destroying his face. But you are a sentinel. You are heading out using your Wind Fury speed to close in on that back line. But, uh, middle engage. This looks something like root the Diablo, hit him with, hit, with the poison damage of Ancestral Wrath, and wail on him with your Wind Fury. But the whole time, you're trying to get those chain lightnings on the back line. You want somebody who's actually going to feel 162 damage at level one. This isn't a lot. You just you're giving you're, them a little shot. You're describing a, a, a damage dealing Ario. Like you're, you're you're dealing damage to the tank to be a battery for your stacks so you can soften up the back line. Exactly, and that's where your lightning should be going. And the lightning isn't the smartest thing on earth. It likes to bounce around randomly. That's why people like crash lightning because. Once they complete the quest, it prioritizes heroes rather than bouncing in the lane minions. But you don't care because every spell hit is a stack. And it's all chaining into the same thing. So let's go to 13. Ideally, unless you're being exploded by Jaina's or require Frostwolf Grace for an, a heal, Grace of Air, Wind Fury attacks, grant twice as many stacks of Frostwolf Resilience. Hey, well, that turns in to Ancestral Wrath stacks. And it works on Anything at all that is an enemy. Bosses, 
hit away. You're going to get those stacks. Now, my favorite part of this is Thunderstorm, the level 16 quest, because it's just good darn fun. Every time you cast Chain Lightning, you slow an enemy hero hit by it by 8%. And this starts stacking on you as a buff, eventually getting a 40% slow, as long as you're hitting different targets. You need to think about this as a slow. So when you're hitting that back line, those Tracers and Genjis, whatever may be hanging out there, even a Rainer, you're empowering your team and yourself with a Wind Fury speed on top of it to close and seal the deal, even to hit an easier route if you're not too good at aiming those wolves. Upon reaching maximum stacks, you gain 25% bonus damage. Again, as long as you never cast it on the same target. Can we just pause the show? I want to play this now. <laughs> it, it's, it's a blast. Honestly, we should because you will have such a good time. It, it, is, it gives you so much clarity as to what you should be doing at every moment. And sometimes you want to use your 25% and hit that same target. Sure, you're going to lose stacks. If you die, you lost the stacks anyway. But this starts hitting like a truck and causes so much control into the area. That we we see heroics here. Uh, heroics are situational. You know, earthquake's great for control. You're going to wish you did Earthquake every time you get to 20 because you're like, oh, Earth and Shield give everyone an ally in the area 15% maximum health every pulse. Every time I take Sundering, I'm super bummed that I did. But Sundering is actually the pick against high mobility because slows aren't going to slow down Tracer. Uh, quick stun to the face will. Just make sure that you're not going to ruin Diablo or Ring of Frost. Or That's the big trouble with Sundering is you're going to ruin somebody's something. Hmm. Well, I'm okay ruining Diablo's day. And that pulse and earthquake is ability damage. And you're getting stacks. I mean, this whole thing is built around getting stacks. Yeah, yeah. So nonstop stackage and maintaining that high damage on an enemy tank to control them for your backline while your tank goes deep and controls theirs while still having the range just to, to participate in what the tank is cooking up. Yeah. And it's, it's super cool, man. I mean, basically, what you're describing with this build is, is the hope for quests to empower one to carry in a game without items or level leads or gold. Yeah, exactly. This is the, the, the promised land of solo carry in that sense. You are empowering yourself while becoming a better team player at the same time. So still being a very healthy part of Heroes of the Storm in that way. It's very cool. Thrall was one of the first heroes, I think it might have been the first hero that post-launch I, I took up straight to a master skin. I remember that, yeah. I just He just clicked for me, and I have not been back on him in a very long time, basically since my, my Zagara into Sonya transition. I haven't really looked at Thrall since. He's not as flashy when he closes... I think my biggest difficulty right now is figuring out what his siege damage is. And I'm talking about connected to a building. Artanis, you get in there, you're seeing crits. That health is flying down. Thrall does decent lock-on melee damage. It just doesn't have a continuous throughput. It's not as frequent as some of our other here. Even Avala, you lock on Zul'jin. There goes the core. You lost when he's in range. Uh, Dingo just makes it worse, but still... Zul'jin can end a game if he gets in range. Thrall, it's a little more wishy-washy, but really Thrall, think about I mean, Thrall is is pretty unique in in that I've always thought of him as a more burst hero. Yeah, you know, even though yeah, he can keep swinging away, and his auto attack is no slouch by any means. But he he's definitely not in the realm of your Rainers and your Zul'jins. But he's still but he's still not like as far in the burst combo category as a Kerrigan is. Like he's very unique in that way. Alpha Wolf, I mentioned earlier, is a level 16 talent. For three seconds after hitting a hero with Feral Spirit, Thrall's basic attacks against enemies deal an additional 3% of the target's maximum health. It also increases the duration of Feral Spirit by 1.5 seconds. This is such a cool option for destroying that stitches and what have you. 
don't be seduced by this early. This is this is very easy to mess up because you're going to put a lot of effort into the tanks. Uh, this would be different if it was the if it was any target. You land a feral spirit and then you go running in the back line. Awesome, you got giant killer for that. But it's the against them in the word usage here that means it only works on the target of the feral spirit, and you're often just going to put too much effort into the tank in this case. Yeah, yeah, like that would be super cute if it was to any heroic target after landing a feral spirit, but it's only to the target of that feral spirit landing. Right. And then you'll, in that situation we talked about where you zone your back line and then attack the front, you're going to be stuck dancing between the two going, I want to, but at the same time, I might be able to take Diablo. And sometimes you do, but oftentimes your Arthas would really like some help up there. <laughs> yeah. All good points. All good points. No matter what my opinion of Diablo at the moment is. So very cool. Well, you've got a link to your whole build right here in the show notes, which you can always find over at amove.tv. Just look for the uh, episode post for the corresponding episode number. This is episode 266. The show notes are always linked at the very bottom. It's a link to a Google Doc. But we pretty much mentioned all of the talents here. You know, So if you're one of those notepad people, there you go. It's great. It's so much focus. Nothing made thrall click like this build and the ancestral wrath presence that you bring to the top of every fight the middle of every fight when you're 10 the end of every it, it doesn't stop you can chain these things and mm, you're just oh and you're running in tower range because you're just getting healed by ridiculous amount, amounts and you're taking all the chromy shots because you don't care it's a blast <laughs> sounds like a great time man well awesome well dead center thank you for your email uh and kyle thank you for teaching yourself to play a new hero no, thank you, Thrall, <laughs> for filling out my roster in such a fantastic way. Thank you, Thrall, for getting data mined out of BF. Sorry, spoilers. Uh, moving on. <laughs> Before we uh, open what will probably be a very sizable mailbag, uh, let's thank our patrons who are supporting us. Um, hey, folks, uh, I don't know if you know this, but Kyle and I, we, we create podcasts for a living. Uh, and the only way we're able to do that is because awesome folks over at patreon.com slash ITN are supporting us. And uh, very recently, we updated some of our Patreon goals because there's been an ebb and flow over there. We've seen some people leave with uh, the with HGC going away, which is completely understandable. <laughs> so um, with our other shows, we know there's a lot of crossover with the Intel and Access audience. And so we figured it's time to update our goals to reflect that. So if you are a fan of the other content that Kyle and I create, and you'd like to see us create some more content, well, head on over to patreon.com slash ITN, take a look at what those goals are and uh, consider chipping in however much works for you. Uh, we very much appreciate it. And to some of our newer patrons, Vivian M, my own Galactus and Ryan K, uh, K thank you so much. Thank you for pledging to support this show with your hard-earned dollars. We very much appreciate it. And we look forward to playing games with you, as we often do each month. This month, we're going to be squeezing it into the beginning of May, May 2nd. Cyanimus will be up very soon for you patrons to join us for some games, a game night in Heroes of the Storm that we always look forward to. Indeed. So we're going to end up having two bonanzas in may one at the beginning and one at the very very end uh but yeah go sign up it's over patreon.com slash itn uh, and you get other perks too like getting added to the patron discord all you have to do is add your discord information to your patreon account and if you are currently a subscribed into the nexus supporter you just automatically get added to our patron server so go check it out and thanks again for supporting us over at patreon.com slash itn and now, like we tend to do with episodes we have to record earlier than usual, we're going to take a lot of questions from you fine folks. Darkness, stop calling. I hear the wilds call. Wait, nature calls. Okay, tell them I'm not here. You can send your emails to itncast at gmail.com, drop a message in the patron discord if you are a patron and you have your discord linked up, or if you're a patron also, just send us a message. That works too. There's plenty of ways to get in touch with us here and into the Nexus. Tau of Craft is going to start us off this week. Tau wants to know, can you please answer one question once and for all? 
Lenora's level one talent, natural perspective, quote, nature's toxin reveals enemies for its duration, end quote, does not reveal invisible heroes once they go invisible, even after they have been tagged with Lunara's toxin. Shouldn't it, for the dura- duration, show the cloaked hero after hit with the toxin basic attack? If not, what the F does reveal mean? Towers reveal, and Lunara's toxin does not? All right. So this is a little bit going back to our language of what the 2017 update, Winter, the promised BlizzCon stealth rework. There are several states of stealth. There is stealth, which is the in motion Zera tool. You can see his little predator outline moving along. And then there's invisible, where you are fully invisible. Oftentimes a character has to stand still to achieve this state, and they are not shown at the, on the map at all. Or on, at the very beginning of their cloak state, like a like a, a Valera or um, uh, Samora. Exactly. There's, there's one other minor rule before we get to that one. That's on beacons. You can't be invisible because otherwise you'd walk on a beacon and be like, why, why is the beacon changing? So they give you a silhouette there to make sure things are readable. The unrevealable state is a specialty invisible state where certain characters gain the unrevealable status and they are free to move through damage, take damage, and they will not be uninvisibled and they will not be pushed into stealth and they will not break stealth. They are unrevealable. And that is probably what's happening to your natural perspective. So what happens with natural perspective is Lenara gets any poison via nature's blossom or auto attack onto a target. They now have a ticking dot. It's a dot. If they're taking damage, they will not go into stealth. That is a that is a part of stealth. Most of it is if you don't take damage or deal damage yourself, for three seconds you enter the stealth classifier and will advance to invisible if you should stand still. So what's happening is you're probably putting natural perspective onto a character that has an unrevealable state like Valera or Samudo. If you're doing this to Zeratul, that should be impossible. Zeratul will always be revealed by the continuous poison damage on him. Yeah. Yeah, it should be the same for Nova. Well, Nova has other tricks. Nova has a specialty one button that allows her to enter stealth, but I'm going to look this up here and make sure, but I'm pretty sure that one does not have a unrevealable state as she is a ranged assassin and they didn't want to give her the same tools that Zeratul or that uh, Zeratul's a special case because he's got playing, but that Valera and Samuro have. Uh, you also have like spell invisibles like uh, Medivh can cast out. I think Brightwing still has a uh, invisibility right on her teleport at level 20 yes closing in on that one right now that is invisible friends <laughs> uh, if, if you blink healed on a cast hero they gain stealth while stealth by invisible friends they heal over time if they remain stationary for 1.5 seconds the stealth becomes invisible. It's kind of a Magic the Gathering sort of spell capping and counter striking and mana tapping. It's a bit messy, honestly. And it, it's not anyone's fault that it has confused you as to why certain heroes seem to not be revealed. It's also important to note here that the revealed status is a lot like when you fire a chromie bolt and hit an enemy hero from the Fog of War. They can move freely through the Fog of War. You just know where that one hero is. They are revealed as a character, but you get zero sight around them. So the Nova runs past ETC and reveals that the whole team is coming in. No, it doesn't. There's no there's no sight given. It's just just the character's model is there for you. Ghost Protocol is the button on Nova. Activate to instantly stealth Nova and spawn a hollow decoy at your location. Nova is unrevealable for the first 0.7 or 0.5 seconds while stealthed. While invisible, it should say, by Ghost Protocol. So most heroes have some way, and because Nature Toxin has a three-second timer, and they probably go, ah, I'm under attack, I'm a stealth here, and they run away for 2.5 seconds, activate this, they probably seem to disappear into nothingness. That would explain it. 
I mean, it's one of the it's reasons not- I love Alara so damn much. It's just every time, the, for the first second of me hitting D, it's just like, I can do whatever I want. I can walk through whatever I want. I can get hit by whatever I want. It doesn't matter. Don't get rid of And I do think Valyra is pretty smartly designed because you have to wait a whole three seconds for your abilities to gain the bonus range on them, the 100% bonus range on your ambush, cheap shot, and garrot. We used to just pop into stealth for half a second. You basically played her like a melee, melee assassin who would by chance have a butcher like stun after being invisible for all of 0.5 seconds which you can still do you're just not going to have that increased range so you do have to stand on top of your targets basically exactly but yeah so this is certainly a um can be a frustrating thing playing against already frustrating heroes because let's face it self can be annoying and with the prevalence of zero tool right now can be particularly annoying but this shouldn't be happening with zero tool Right. Zeratul does not have any unrevealable statuses. Correct. Which I think lots of people are shocked that he didn't receive any sort of update in the last balance patch. A lot of our friends certainly seem to be that way, and I am too. But hopefully that kind of clears it up for you, Tao. Thanks for writing in. Uh, Crushinator wrote in from the patron discord and said, Do you guys think we need shards anymore? The only way to get shards is in loot boxes or by converting gold. So why not just make it all gold? Put gold drops in loot boxes, gold refunds on duplicates, gold prices for crafting. I don't see any good reason to have one-way conversion system anymore. All right. I feel him. The only thing I can come up with here is that it would be damn scary looking in the pricing if they went with everything gold. This has also been an incremental system that they've transferred over to. They want gold to be generated by the stim pack. It's what makes it special. So maybe the loot boxes lose their specialness. I don't have a good answer for you other than that. You would, you know, you go to your favorite hero and you go to skins and you say, why? That skin is relatively cheap at 1,200 shards. And you might mentally say, I'll buy it with gems. Whereas instead, it'd be sitting there at a gold price of 22,000 gold. (laughs) Yeah, but if you streamline gold, it's kind of all relative, right? Like if we start getting gold from duplicates, we start getting gold from chests. It's a relative. You'd be accruing more gold. Maybe everything would even out. That's the only thing I can come up with is that it would just be spooky looking to see a brand new the things they want you to buy gems on if a brand new skin comes out you know, let's find something from the recent uh, Cyber Oni Cy- Cyber Oni and Uberak which someone in the chat room asked like how do you feel about this it's not particularly my jam but that's because it's more or less a reskin they just gave him a new head we already had these skins in the game already for an Uberak, so it doesn't excite me all that much plus I'm a I'm an Anubarak uh, Anubalisk main sure a, a, a purist of the art Yes, got a, anything that makes him, makes characters just look like a Zerg unit, I'm there. So for that fine purchase in a modern event, we'd be looking at 30? So 30,000, uh, so 36,000 gold. So how are you calculating that? The, the current exchange rate from gold to shards? Correct. So it is 500 shards. So we need uh, 1,800 shards for this brand new skin. At 500 shards, it's 10,000 gold. And for that extra 100 shards, you're going to need to do three times would be 6,000 at 2,000 each. I mean, let's be honest. They, they could just make things a little cheaper. I, I'm curious to see what the level up system's going to be. We know that it's also now... Uh, well, we don't know, but... We can all tinfoil hat agree that Blizzard likes its big patches and we'll probably see whatever the new reward system is tied into when they decide to update the quest system tied into the rank progression system. That's a lot of hope. (laughs) That's a lot of hoping, Kyle. But the reason I say all that is because the progression system should have already been here. We're in the preseason. We need to see if you're going to call it the brand new season. I'd like to see what those new mounts just stop gaining the mounts. People want mounts. Everybody, bronzers, golds, 
masters, they all want sweet mounts. Don't stop them. Yeah. Don't don't gate your content. I think it's fine to rank. have you know some armor on the higher end ones, but like give the normal mount to everybody. Yeah. Did you play? I mean, I, Did you play some games? Cool. Here's a mount. I mean, I honestly love a, a a banner slot. Like you get to fly a flag on your butt of your mount. Oh, if oh, you're masters. Gotcha. Gotcha. It's probably asking a little much. And then they, they just slap it away. Yeah, I know. I know I'm asking a lot right now, but and I'm making up stuff that's hard to do. But I, I think that would be a greater reward for Masters is for the time that you're Masters, you get to ride around and be like, look at me, I'm Masters. Not what I can do is go, hey, remember Tychus meta? Check out my lion that I earned when I was Masters during the Tychus meta two years ago. <laughs> so you want, you want a year. You want like a stamp. Like this is when I got this. This is yeah. when I was good. I am currently of this level. Look at me. Not mm. observe me in the past. <laughs> I'm riding around my master's trophy in Bronze League. I, I really do think because there's there's a the only premium that a mount ever has to me, like the turtles from last season, is when I see them this season. And then next season I won't care that you were masters because now we're multiple seasons away from that season. I just like mounts that look cool. So like when we got the Raptor mount. That's that's the only yeah. one I've legitimately cared about because I think the Raptor mount's amazing. And it looked great with armor and it was yeah. sad that people who love dinosaurs didn't get armored dinosaurs. I really wanted that armored version and I couldn't get there. Yeah. I couldn't get there. But uh, to answer Crush, for, for me to answer Crush's question because I don't think I did. Uh, no, I don't think we need shards anymore. But Crush, I have a feeling you knew this because I, I know you've been listening a while and I know you know my opinion on uh, in-game currencies and having too many of them which I do believe Heroes of the Storm has. Well, you're also anti-gem to the maximum. So Gems. I want gems to die in a fire. I think you are you will find low amounts of pushback in most corners of the internet. I agree. <laughs> with you, with yourself. But I also feel I will be sitting here asking for them to die in a fire for the rest of my God-given life. I think that's fair. I think we are... <laughs> We're entering a, a whole new age of video games, like we talked about at the top of the show. People are, and I think that people are realizing that with mobile games too, you know? You go look for a decent mobile game, people are going to tell you, well, pony up, five bucks, but you'll, you'll get KOTOR. Y you're crazy, man. You can buy KOTOR for $10 and play it on your phone, and well, I want something free. Well, then let me list you the crap you're going to have to deal with. How do you feel about playing a billboard ma masquerading as a game? <laughs> right? But this is nothing new, Kyle. You just, just you just had a your, that hot take is like a decade old. Uh, totally, totally. But you know, I, I feel like as, as as a well, maybe not. Maybe it is old. I've I've only finally gotten a phone that actually can run things. Uh fair, fair. I, I mean, to update your your point, I think that mentality uh, has very much seeped its way into AAA titles. Hmm. Uh, it, it, I think it already peaked, and it peaked with a game called Battlefront 2. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that uh, definitely took it too far, saw a lot of pushback, and had to completely course correct it as, as a result. Um, so now, now brags about those as features, that it won't have these awful attachments to them. Yeah, yeah, the new Star Wars game by Respawn. It's just like, it's just a story. You buy the game and play it. And I'm sitting here going, what a novel concept. Where have I heard about this before? Oh, that's right. Only every other game I ever played for the rest of my life. How strange. Those are awesome features. Put them on the box. I'll be honest, though. That does sound really refreshing. Yeah, it does. It does. <laughs> Even and though I just I... played God of War, and that's exactly what that game is. I paid my money and played it. I just played Spider-Man. That's exactly what it is. I paid my money and played it. And it was wonderful. Well, but also you know, look at something like the war chest that StarCraft is doing. People and uh, our supporters of this show as well. People, when they see value in something, are willing to share that value between the exchange, the person that you're given to the company, and what you're going to get back. And as long as that value is maintained, we're happy to do those things. So get rid of the gimmicks. Yep. I'm done with it. I just want to pay the actual money amount for the thing I want in Heroes of the Storm. Yeah, it was an odd time, 2.0. Such, such a... Blizzard's always been a little late to things, and they they were seduced 
by the dark side. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, uh, I guess they're like a full step better than Nintendo in terms of being late to things. <laughs> That's true. Nintendo just straight up misses things. And it, it, well, I feel like they intent. I feel like Nintendo are hipsters. They're just like, oh, this is popular and it's working for everyone. We're not doing it. We don't care how much you ask for it. And they'll also go and say, controllers, are you sitting still playing with your games? Because I think you should be standing with two batons in each hand while doing cartwheels. And we're like, no. How do you feel about waggling? Because I I, I got a game for you. You want (laughs) to fish? (laughs) Moving on. Jordan. Spoke with a G from the patron discord asks, listening to Kyle and Jeff talk about whether they preferred a Kalethos animation touch-up versus a Ragnaros skin got me excited. I know the devs weren't literally pulling Reddit, but now I'm wondering why they don't. It would be amazing to have polls on which heroes got reworked next, what underperforming talents to buff, which social features to be implemented, etc. Uh, to allow the community to prioritize resource expenditure. It's the correct thing to call it, but that's not a very hype-worthy keyword right there, Jordan. Sure. Uh, if they tell us what's in the pipeline and ask the community buy-in, they'll get loads of interest. Would you guys be interested in something like this? Does it seem realistic? Oh, boy, do I think this is a bad idea, Kyle. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's tough, isn't it? Can I get real? For a yes, second, you may, you may. Let me let me get real. Uh, hi, folks. My name is Garrett Weinzer. I do podcasts for a living, and those podcasts are funded through crowdfunding platforms like Patreon. Kyle, in the past, we have made posts on this very Patreon. This is quite a while ago now, asking if it was okay if we made a certain change in a certain direction. And took suggestions from the patrons as to what direction to take certain goals. Mm -hmm. It has never ended well. (laughs) And not because anyone's a bad person or anyone threw anything back in our face. It is merely the effort that you are showing that you acknowledge something exists. So in this case, would you like Locust to be updated with every skin color? Ooh, well, that sounds really great to Abathur main. I'm going to vote for that. But then everybody else votes for Ragnaros skins, and you hate playing Ragnaros. You're never going to yeah. touch him. You're but already, now, you, you've essentially gotten where I was going, which is there is no way to, to have this sort of vote by committee and not have hurt feelings. The things that you list there that maybe you even have very low intention of ever getting to become future promises. And even though you just thought you, know, you were sitting there like on Twitter and you're like, oh man, I only have three options for my poll and it says I need four. Uh, and you just throw an extra one in there and you're just like, whatever, I'll, I'll recolor Abathur Locus. Those become promises to the community and then mm-hmm. they continue to be brought up. And when that next poll doesn't have that thing and you can't motivate people enough to vote on it, even worse, it sits there taunting you in the face the thing you really want. I think it would go poor, poorly in that way. In a perfect world, let's say... Let's say we got Fortnite and Blizzard was like, Heroes is the biggest thing ever. Cancel everything. All resources into Heroes of the Storm. We had like an app. It'd be really cool for, or in the game itself, to have this activity so that the people playing or the people who are the direct line to Blizzard, you cut out that middleman. But again, you're still in this dream world where the Polygon article runs the next day that says Blizzard's recoloring locusts. And then they look on and say, oh, Blizzard breaks its promise recovering locusts when it never happened. Right. Uh, and, and I mean, some of this too could just be applied to announcing things too soon, which uh, the Heroes team have certainly done. In some in some cases, they've announced things that will never make it to the game. Yeah. You know, we talk so much. How, how many times have we criticized uh, Heroes of the Storm on this very show for words flying at the screen that never made it to the game because we get yeah. we, got those, we got those trailers every BlizzCon and every BlizzCon there were multiple things that flew at the screen that we still haven't seen. Clans being one yeah. of them. Clans being a big one and one that really hurts me personally. I am now that person with the hurt feelings that yeah. I'm talking about. It 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 sadly 
doesn't work, <laughs> in my opinion. I think the gra- the vast majority of people, more than I think most of us who have spent too much time on the internet are actually willing to give, give credit to. I think the vast majority of people are more than mature enough, are, have, have seen enough of these types of things that they can handle it. They're totally fine with it. They're totally cool if they... They put their heart and soul into an honest to God suggestion, give the team really good feedback, and then the, the the what they suggested does not get made and does not make it into the game. The same way that every time we have gone to the supporters of this show and asked them what they would like, 99.9% of everyone that supported us, they're fine. Actually, the majority of the time, when we reach out to folks that support us, we don't hear back. And that's fine. That's totally fine. There are a lot of the supporters of, of any of the shows that I do that have things like a Patreon, a lot of folks just want to support the show. They, they, get their, they get their podcast. They're just happy to give us a dollar, to give us $5, whatever works for them. And I, I think to a certain degree, it's the same is true for a lot of video games. Obviously, I'm, I'm using our own very small community as an example compared to however many players are here at the storm there are. I would assume it's a lot more than who listen to this podcast. But... I see so many through or so many connections between the two. And a lot of that just comes down to you do you, you know, I didn't expect a podcast to do it in this format or in this way. And, and frankly, just, just do you, I don't, I don't even want to interfere. And then there's things that I think are really human uh, outside of the upsetting a community or anything like that. I think that a lot of these devs probably think to themselves, if I have to touch X after doing X, I'm going to lose my mind. So as a human resource activity, they say, all right, you just made five colors of Ragnaros. How about you go uh, update some trees? It's very different activity. You'll be sane over there. We're not going to go make you recolor the next year in line. Maybe. That, that to me says what happened with the lore, right? So if clans are our most requested, I think for me, the way they did lore... And it's, this happened with all the comics. Something happened. Overwatch 2 is just, they stopped the comics. WoW continue to have some comics that got kind of weird with the teeth. If you know what I mean, that one with the teeth are weird. And this, like Sylvanas' sisters are all kind of creepy. Oh, you, I really hate oh, God, you know I have really, really harsh opinions about any piece of art ever. Well, like if I don't like it. You, you know that if I don't like art and we're talking privately, uh, I'm not quiet about it and we'll give it an honest to God critique. I feel weird about doing it, doing it publicly. And now I'm going to be a hypocrite and say the art for that comic is not great. Oh, there we go. Like th- that was, <laughs> there was, there was clearly some thing that happened in Blizzard and they, they all went comics. Comics are amazing. We should all, all properties should have comics. And then they just sort of stopped. I, 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 I get the. I mean, there's a lot of camaraderie. There's a lot of camaraderie at, at Blizzard, and 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 a lot of like-mindedness. Uh, and I I feel, I have nothing to back this up, but I do feel. You know, when you see something cool get made for another team, I'm sure your team probably goes, "Man, we should have one of those. That's dope. Let's make one for our game." Yeah, and, you and then, then the, the team says, "We have that contact. Would you like the contact?" Yes. Oh, they're not busy. They they love working with us. Well, with you, their love you know what I would like the, to go back to is all the cross game promotion we were having in the early days of Heroes of the Storm. And also, mm-hmm. it, well, I guess it really kicked into overgear in 2.0 when Genji hit, and we started having like the Overwatch, get your Overwatch, your Genji skin when you play Genji in Heroes of the Storm, and so on and so forth, and buy Diablo 3, get Vala in Heroes of the Storm. I loved all of that stuff. I don't know why we got away from that. I don't know why we, I think Orphe is a lot of fun. I don't know why we went on that journey. I, we, I wanted to see Ghoul Dan, you know, knocking goblets with Diablo. I want to see Varian high-fiving imperious like i just everybody's friends you know we're all we're all in this crazy nexus world let's just enjoy that part of it yeah and we had to bring it back around to jordan's uh, question which we were answering and then we got into this circle of suggesting the features we'd like to see them work on which is what we're telling them not to do because i think we both agree it's not a great use of time um i there's it, it, it takes a lot of time to do community outreach and there's not a lot of community members left at blizzard right now <laughs> is, is is part of it which i'm just now realizing as i as i no, make that, this point it's savage but true but whether or not be that as it may whether whether they did not just go through the 
the the purge that we just saw over at Blazers HQ uh, or not, I think there's a big balancing act with any game maker right now, which is how much do you invest in community outreach? Because it is a lot of work. And community managers are great. And all the community managers I've worked with at Blizzard have been nothing short of exemplary. Uh, but for, for a game like Heroes of the Storm, you really want to hear from the devs. You want to hear straight from the horse's mouth. And that takes time away from their workday. Well, that's a whole new phenomenon, too. I mean, we're talking about video games in general here. Mobile markets, Fortnite's focus on updates. Something that's new is the celebrity status of a developer. Not not a spokesperson. Not even an actor. Just Ben Brode. How did it happen? What happened? Just... He has an intoxicating energy. We, we want to hear from him. We love his passion. Bring him on out. You know, Chris Metzen in the past, whoa, what? Like, he, he was in charge of the franchise development. He doesn't do everything. But we, we, we begin to see them as a conduit through our communication for the passion for the video game. And that's just, that's weird. It's a weird new thing. Yeah. It is. I mean, it's it's relatively new, right? Like for 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 me, <laughs> having been on the Angry Chicken for as long as I have, um, it, it feels old because it's the whole lifetime of that show essentially. Now it's kind of over because Ben Bro left, and he took with him that celebrity status. And while mm. there are certainly members of Team Five, I'm a big fan of, and I love hearing from. Kosak is one of the funniest dudes I've ever been lucky enough to interview. Uh, it's it's not to the same level. No one is on the 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 the, the Hearthstone subreddit demanding that David Kosak freaking come out and do a new rap for the Rise of Shadows expansion. Get in here, come on! You know everyone loves it. I mean, we're also sitting here, April, late April, no BlizzCon announcement. Yeah, which I'm like, oh my god, are we actually Speaking weird things? Are we actually not going to have one, or are they pushing it later? I don't know. Like I, for me, it was, it was always like tax season, BlizzCon. It, it, the two were hand in hand. Are, are, are we are we, uh, are we taking a, a segue into BlizzCon town? Yes. Yeah. Well, let's, okay. Let's write it. Do you think they can even push it later? Because the closer to Thanksgiving we get, the more expensive travel is. I, I don't. I don't know. It's that's a good point. You know, it is a, a kind of in a sweet spot of getting to recover before that next. Travelocalypse. Yeah, if anything, do it earlier again. Get it back into October. Like, if we... like, Okay, maybe they could push it to, like, second week of November. But third? Oh, nope. That would be I terrible. And you can't go after Thanksgiving, because then you're just straight up into holiday to Holidayville. Wasn't Overwatch an invite tournament this last year as well? It's... Uh, the, Overwatch at BlizzCon is always the, the World Cup, which is different from okay. their... Is, which is different from Overwatch League. It's right. very so much it's the not, same way. It's not a culmination. Correct. Same thing with Hearthstone. Uh, at least the last few years have been the the the, the international tournament, not HCT. Right. And very show matchy. Correct. Well, I mean, there's st it's still it's not like invitational, quote unquote. It's still there's still brackets and there's still months of lead up and a whole system, but um, it's not the main event. It's not HCT. Is and Overwatch is not Overwatch League. Although there's been a lot of rumors that I believe Hearthstone is going back to their premier tournament now that HCT is over and they're moving to a new system. I wonder if there's really that much to culminate in a BlizzCon anymore anyway with these things going year round. Well, yeah, I mean, StarCraft has not deviated basically for its lifetime at this point. Well, StarCraft 2 anyway. Yeah. Like StarCraft 2 still has its major finals at the at BlizzCon every year like clockwork. The culmination of North America, Europe, and Korea regions all smashing together at BlizzCon. Uh, same is true for World of Warcraft. Um, is that it? Is it just is StarCraft? Because now Heroes is gone. Because it used to be WoW, Heroes, StarCraft 2 had their major tournaments, their major finals of the year at BlizzCon every year. Now we've yeah. lost Heroes. So is it just StarCraft and World of Warcraft? And then we have the like international like almost soccer-esque Overwatch tournament. Uh, and Hearthstone is an unknown because they changed up their esports this year. Hmm. I mean, it's still a lot. 
It's, it's decent. That's still a lot, but it's strange that it's this late because I, I can't see them pushing it. I mean, I guess, I guess honestly, the tickets are sold so far in advance that maybe they're just selling the tickets closer to the event for some yeah. reason. It, it could maybe. be the case, but uh, it, it does seem strange. Hmm. Whatever mm. the case is, now that I'm back on the StarCraft train, wherever the StarCraft finals are going, I would like to go. That's fair. I miss HGC. I miss a lot, Kyle. It's... There's a hole there. And it... Despite all the grassroots stuff that happens, there is that lack of a culmination of it that warrants the same hype and being caught up in it. Anyways, moving on, Starbuck wrote in, said, here's a question I've been thinking of. Over the course of playing this game, it's become clear to me that there are two different approaches to playing ranked. One, play what your team needs to fit the comp or map or counter the enemy, staying within your reasonable hero pool at least. So one, be flexible. Two, play exactly what you want regardless of what's happening in the draft lobby. <laughs> The best examples of this are the classic Instalock Novas and the Nova and the Murkies that hover the entire time, listen to their team, beg them not to do it, and then lock as last pick no matter what happens. I, I would caution that that's probably the most negative light you could put this particular right. topic in. There, there are two types of people in the world. Those who are good, healthy adults and those who are monsters. Those who are helpful and those who are, who are degradating. Uh, I have always been inclined to approach the game from the former perspective, if for no other reason than to not be a jerk. <laughs> Starbuck, your opinion is showing through. Mm. However, I recently had a game that left me pretty, pretty flustered. The fact of the matter is, I am a truly terrible tank player. I wish I could do it. I really do, but I am miserable at it. I play any other role and be happy about it, but I can't win a game with a tank. The other day I had a game where I was very clear about this, but it ended up tanking anyway. We got crushed. Everyone was mad, so on and so forth. So, is it better to be flexible or just to play your carry no matter what? And Starbuck, I hope it doesn't come as a surprise that my instant answer is the truth is in a happy medium between these two. Right, but let's take my strategy here for an example. Thrall is kind of lame in my book. It's not a big monster. It's Thrall. It's a thrall. I could be the Lich King. I could be Diablo. I could be Asmodan, summoning demons, raining them from the sky. When Hero League was on, I was much more resilient to the force picks that either came from HTC or the current meta of the week, sometimes shorter than a week. That new hero that just came out that is OP and I haven't practiced on. I was really, I had some heavy walls and defenses against picking those guys. But now that we are in Storm League, my opinions really changed because we're moving slower. And in the past, I'd say, oh, I'm, I happen to be first pick in this Hero League match. First pick meaning I have to pick first and early. And I really don't like playing Number A, number one, Genji. Oh, I just don't want to play him. I'm not going to learn him. I'm, I'm going to pick something else. Can we ban Genji? And they're like, no, don't we? Have, we get first pick. Screw you, pick Genji. That, that world is over now for the most part. And you can, and for me, that means I now have the freedom. Oh, I just need an invite. I, need, I have the freedom to early pick Genji if I really wanted to, if the meta called for it. And because of the way I'm currently maximizing my climb and making sure my time in the game is of highest efficiency, I'm spamming an early pick hero for my league, Kael'thas. I, ju I just want him off. I don't want him good to go to the enemy team. I think he's an excellent lane clear. I think he controls team fights well. He brings a stun to the back line, a follow-up to the tank. He brings everything I desire. And so I early pick him. So I would say the, the lawful evil is perhaps the Nova, because they'll still participate. The chaotic evil, if we're doing D&D &D here, is the Murky, perhaps, who doesn't care at all and doesn't fit in most team comps, perhaps. You can take that same part, too, that you're talking about and make it chaotic good and say, all right, I'm going to early pick 
this thing that I do so well. And it's my one pocket pick for this current meta. But we can have that instead. So when you're saying I end up on terrible, I'm a terrible tank, I end up late pick. Well, take what you're good at and find the early picks in the current meta. And now you won't be tank. But you're also now, now you're a, a two. You're a person who picks exactly what they want, regardless of what's happening in the draft. Very well said. Well, you also started to t- touch on something that I hadn't really thought of until right now, but I've, I realized I've been doing nonstop with my Rexar remaining, uh, which is how things have changed as we come to first come, first serve. And um, I am essentially judging the shown picks of everyone else on my team as lesser than mine when I just insta lock Rexar for the first pick on our team. Yeah. But I, the sweet spot we've always talked about on this show is are you not only taking an advantageous position and draft for your team, but also removing the chance of it on the enemy side? Because yes. you could be the best Vala on Earth, but <laughs> chances are it's not going to come up. Yes, uh, but I'm also being selfish. Sure. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm admitting that I'm being selfish while using all of these, uh, all this other meta knowledge that I have as uh, 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 as uh, uh, armor to protect myself against someone calling me out. I'm being selfish. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's a healthy, you got to maintain an ego. You, know? you do. You, do, you really do. And it's something I think we've, we've talked about a lot on this show, which is, um, especially when we're in the middle of maining things, when you were maining Raynor, when you were maining Tychus, when I was maining Zagara, when I was maining Sony, and now I'm maining Rexar. Uh, we have this conversation time and time again, which is pick what you're good at. Pick what you know you will win with, um, especially if you have stats and, and personal stats to back it up. Um, yeah, Starbuck, I'm with you. I know I was teasing you a little bit on your number two being a, pr- a pretty obvious uh, t- uh, tell of what your opinion is on the, on this fact. Yeah, Nova and Murkies, not the best thing to just insta lock. All right, you're not taking a pick away from anyone on the other team. Although I'm seeing so many Novas right now, you might be. Nova, you might mm. be. Murky, it's still pretty few and far between. But whatever the case is, you know if your pick is going to be taking a pick away from the opposing team or not. Like, you listen to this show. You're clearly looking at statistics and seeing what, what's happening around the hero's sphere. So, yeah, I mean, don't, maybe don't go first pick a Nova, but you playing Rexar? Are you playing an Uberak? Are you a god-tier Kel'Thuzad? Yeah, maybe it's worth worth showing and picking early. Get yourself into your comfort zone and let people flex around you. As for the one specific example that Starbuck put in here of, of getting forced into the tank role, it happens every now and then. Starbuck, I, I, I would ask you, does this happen a lot? in my experience, this doesn't happen a lot. You know, I really don't want to support right now. It used to be my favorite role. I don't want to do it for you. I don't know you. I don't know if you're going to do anything with what I'm doing for you. I'm not interested in supporting for pickup games. Well, and there it gets a little bit back in that ego thing of this is a game where you have to put a lot of games into climb. And mm-hmm. if you are out of your league, if you believe you could be somewhere higher up, you need to put up some, basic walls and build a, you know, a, a, a betting for yourself and make sure that you can withstand those losses. And some heroes that you play really well, you know when things are going bad. It's not your fault. And there are that's one of the great things about a spell caster often with mages is you can give 100% and know that for the most part it wasn't your fault because you can't do more. You can't dive the back line. You can't suddenly do amazing auto attacks while on cooldown. I got yelled at this past week because I was dancing. I, I, I was Kael'thas. I would throw out my spells, and then I'd go dance around. But they had a garage. So I'm not going to take Kael'thas and be like, all right, I'm on cooldown, but here come the autos. You know, and just like get in there and get ground broke and thrown over a wall. So I danced in the back line while I waited on cooldowns and people got mad at me because I'm dancing around. But that's fine because I know what I was doing and we won that game and everyone was like, good job, Kael'thas. And I I knew I didn't die to Garrosh. So you need those defenses. But the other final bit that I think we can say is... I, I, (laughs) I feel like that example would have been better had you lost. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you were vindicated because you won. I need that example, Kyle. But where you lose and you still feel okay and secure in your own decision. 
I, I have one of those too. Uh, we lost and they spread decent living bombs, but it wasn't the type of damage we needed. And so I walked away from it knowing that I need to go Pyromaniac now instead of Fission because I have changed leagues. I have, I've moved up to a, a point where bigger living bombs and spreading them, those mistakes aren't as strong as they used to be. And I would dance in the back less if I was reducing my own cooldowns. So that's why I brought up the winning story is because when it's a loss, now sometimes you just end up with, you know, and it, this is where you start accusing heroes and I don't you know, like that the most, but you end up with a first pick of Lydon on Cursed Hollow and you do all you can, but you, and it's a 66% win rate. I'm not knocking Illidan. It's just Storm League solo queue. You know, what are you, what are you, what are you hoping for here? And mm -hmm. it goes a little weird and you're just like, there's, I couldn't have been with him. I, I'm, I'm not going to, grab onto his uh, blindfold tails and ride with him into that battle. His uh, his metamorphosis of wings. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. No, I feel you. Um, yeah. So, again, if you keep losing because you get forced on the tank and you don't want to learn the tank, which I think is a perfectly reasonable reaction to have, you need to force yourself onto those roles. Or you can learn tank. Or you can learn to tank. Which, I mean, honestly, if you're last pick and you're like, oh my god, I don't know how to play any tanks, there's some pretty attractive ones, like Malganus, who plays a lot like a pokey weirdo assassin, but has the ability... Malganus has the ability to break, and his health isn't as volatile and changing in its reactions to damage as something like a Nubarak. A Nubarak, you need to know your shields and when to pop them, and what resists what? And if you're under a bunch of auto attacks, it doesn't matter, but it still has some shielding. A Diablo Arthas, you can just be horribly out of position and you could be trying to type like, everyone run for it but me, but people keep trying to be heroic. Like Malganis just has a lot of in and outs. And that's where I'd suggest you put your time over someone like Muradin, hmm. who seems like he has those abilities, but just doesn't have the win rate to back it up. Man, Illidan fell a hell off recently. No, did he? I missed that's this. Interesting. He's 48% win rate. Oh, wow. He's above huh. Gul'dan, below Imperius. Look yeah, look that. at that. Blaze currently has a higher win rate than Malganus. Huh? Bla I mean, Blaze is all right. Not by he, much, he but... <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm talking about, like, learning quick. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you're right. Look at this on Illidan, too. He's down to a flat 50% on Cursed Hollow, so whatever power he had, he has lost it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of polymorphs going on. <laughs> yeah, that's true. A lot of bright wings. A lot of bright wings going around. You can learn ETC. You can learn Do Johanna, but none of them are quite as brawly as Malganus. Even Blaze, you gotta lay out your oils and light them on fire and very, stand on he's them. Very he's very slow. He's very slow. You want to be brawly? Maybe, uh, maybe an Artanis um, is a pretty unique skill set, though. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly pretty unique skill set so Tyrael's making a comeback I'm excited about that one I really am Tyrael's making a comeback and, and that might be that might be actually a weirdly good place to start because of just how active of a hero Tyrael is really focus on that stalwart angel uh, it's a level 4 talent gain 25 armor while Eldrune's might is active so you throw mm -hmm. out your sword into a safe spot and then you go wander in while you have man or while you have 25 armor and just absorb things for the team knowing you can leave at any point. Yeah. Yep. Anyways, hopefully that helps you, Starbuck. But we've all been there, for sure. Um, but I don't think there's anything wrong with either. You know, showing your pick and locking it, being flexible, depends on the team. Right now, I'm not being flexible at all. Nope, me neither. <laughs> so we're not great examples of that. No, but I have been in the past. Yeah. Uh, anyway, LDAP, LDAP from the Patreon Discord asks, what was our favorite balance change from the most recent patch? Arthas's freaking aura going down to mana cost. I love it. Yep, Uther getting some mana back would be mine as well. I'm really excited to see that he is doing some solo supporting now. Uh, I am sad to report that if we were to have a bummer from last patch, it would be Malthiel. Malfield's sweet upgrade where I was talking about doing, you know, something like, what was it, uh, 24 total percent health to a tank or something like that? 
Uh-huh. Well, guess what? Doesn't Raid stack? Strike still costs mana. Oh, yeah. So casting four Wraith Strikes at level 20 means you're out of juice on the other side of it. <laughs> no, it was 24% of a tank's health. Yeah, I mean there was yeah. others. There was dots and stuff I mean, like that's that. A, I mean that's a pretty personal bummer, right? Like we're looking at talents that no one was picking in the first place. Yeah, like it's fine. Mouth heal still works uh, very well, I, I think. As we were just talking about, uh, it's funny to say that I actually haven't looked at his. He's down a little bit. He's still above fifty percent, which is more than I can say for half of the heroes that exist right now. Yeah. So, uh, poor mouth heal. Yeah, sorry, bud. Sorry, bud. Unpronounceable writes in and says, on last week's episode, you mentioned Divine Shield Uther with Melee Jaina as a really cute pair. What other cute combos have you seen or would like to explore? Uh, can I tell you just the, just the most degenerate thing I was doing with Derivo? All right. <laughs> this was last week. I mean, we just we had so much to talk about. I didn't get to really sit down and powwow, have a story time with you. Um, me on Rex are Derivo on, on Anubarak. It was just... Stun a death of Palooza. Like, Ooh. Nobody got to do what they wanted on the enemy team, and it was amazing. It was so it was, good. What's the order of the engagement? It didn't matter. Whoever got a stun, <laughs> the other stuns came in. It was yeah. absolute it was jazz. It was murder jazz. Like you just one of us would start and the other one would pick up what they started. It would it was just the best. And oh my god, no cocoon targets. Like you know how you cocoon sometimes so you can push past the tank? to get to the back line and then the back line retreats and you're like, we're going to kill this tank and they get away somehow. Yeah. <laughs> Never happened. <laughs> they, they, we Never always away. murdered the tank. It was so good. I loved it. It was so mean. We were total that, That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it sounds like a good frame up because all you got to do is have that regenerating something alongside a new Barak so the healer is not overtaxed. And Misha fulfills that role. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does, man. And then, you know, I'm taking the, I'm, especially when I, you know, when I play with someone I know, like Derivo, taking the the bird talent that increases your auto attack speed, like you, you just bring your yeah. own mini assassin to the. A lot of times when I play it alone in pickup games, I don't. I haven't been taking that right now. Just the charge still seems like just easier, making my life a little bit easier. But when I when I have someone I can trust, and I'm like, I know I can stand and deliver on Rexar. Oh, it's disgusting. Oh, aspect of the hawk is is a blast at 13, and he really didn't suffer too much. I'm I'm happy for you in that. Rexar is down a whole 0.2%. Still the top winniest hero in the game. He is. He is. And at his 58%, I think it is at his peak over on Hot Slugs. We saw him at like a 61%. But let's be honest, that's freaking yeah. that's too high. That's, <laughs> that's too absurd. much. That's too 58% much. is too high. I, I'm worried about enough. I'm really worried they're going to nerf his damage. Like it's, well, and when we're looking at a 12% popularity, it's not like you got to ban that Rexar. He's, he's incoming. It's going to be a part of this game. That is true. That is true. Though... I mean, it's it's still a decent amount of games played, but uh, yeah, I, he's still my he's still my jam. Still playing Nubarak at the at the moment, but yeah. Anyway, uh, what are your answers? Oh, uh, for uh, sick combos, you and I do one that's very fun and very wacky, uh, which very, is the Morales Valera. <laughs> also very mean. It is very mean. It's basically a invincible Valera that uh, just slamming those sinister strikes as hard as you can over and over again. I get to stay in that fight a lot longer than I should. Yeah, and then when we win or do whatever else, we just fly to the next spot. So Actually, I never a lot, of, a lot of times when we don't win, we fly to the next spot. We're like, oh, this didn't work. Let's try a different angle. We just yeah, fly the Valera's going to gonna pursue and Morales, you know, can be in quite a bit of trouble if she overextends. So having the flying heel bus to get yourself out of there yeah. is just a blast. Uh, Lily Cassia, I think, is is a really cute one that I do with Kristen from time to time. I talked last week about uh, Alex Straza Li Ming, which two cute combos. They kind of work with each other. The orbs out of the W for Li Ming. Here you have blinds with blinds, so it's not the most adorable thing on earth. Uh, Butcher White Mane, though. It's not like Taronda where you're like, the stun follows up the stun, and it's kind of boring and obvious with the... It, Something I, I have trouble deducing what exactly it is with Butcher White Mane, but that is really fun. And there's a talent later on. Let me grab the name of it here. I think it's just adorable. Uh, shared punishment. Upon casting, Inquisition can chain to an additional enemy hero near the target. 
And that works with clemency. So you target your heel beam on the butcher and flying out of him aggressively is a inquisition beam. What? Yeah, it's really what? cool. <laughs> the reason you never see this is because it's up against uh, lashed out, but also up against radiance. R- like, radiance is the most popular. Actually, I'm looking yeah. at hot slugs right now. Radiance and charity punishment are really close for pick rate. Yeah, uh, lashing out is like no one taking it, but but radiance and shared punishment pretty close, pretty close. You don't have, I can, to, you I have can the see, harsh discipline to pull this off. Yeah, I can see that on a butcher just being gross. It's it's fun, and then you got forty armor for the guy when you do that. Uh, that Scarlet Aegis, good stuff. Mm. I haven't played butcher in a while, and I love playing him. Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it, yeah. good sir. That's a, I feel a, a new quick match uh, duo coming up. Oh yeah, let's, we're bored uh, let's with the Morales Valera. Let's try that. Let's try that. But uh, yeah, thank you everyone who wrote in. We got so many questions, we, we we couldn't get to them all. But thank you so much for uh, for being a part of our mailbag since we we're going to have to record a little early this week. Um, Kyle again, dude. I can it. Uh, congrats on you and Kristen's pregnancy. I'm so stoked for you to become parents. I'm stoked too, man. It's 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 a an adorable time, and I'm excited to show her off to the family who is thrilled to pieces because this is the first baby of the of the official small local family if you will well we'll enjoy that trip man i hope i get to see you and uh but before before we say bon voyage to you for for a few days um thanks again to everybody supporting us over at patreon.com slash itn if you want to support the podcast that's the best way to do so huge thanks to our patreon producers declan h and cheesy bob there's t-shirts available at shirts.amove.tv. We're usually live Thursdays at 5 p.m. Eastern time at twitch.tv slash amove.tv. There will not be one this uh, this week because of what we just mentioned. Kyle will be traveling. So we're recording this episode earlier than usual. So if Anduit has been announced, we're sorry. We'll talk about him next week. And we'll have had a lot more time to play him if he's on the PTR. Exactly. Be a good little chat. Uh, follow us on Twitter at ITNCast. I'm Garrett Art. He's Kyle Ferguson. And before we go, Kyle, where can everybody find everything else you do? You can find me normally over at twitch.tv slash Kyle Ferguson, two S's in Ferguson. But of course, I will be on that trip and that'll be missing this next week. Uh, but you can find VODs that will continue to be uploaded through my absence over at youtube.com slash Kyle Ferguson. You can find this podcast and many others like it over at amove.tv. A lot of stuff happening in Hearthstone, so go subscribe to The Angry Chicken. I have a solo podcast called R2T2, which you can find by searching for R2-T2 wherever podcasts can be found. I typically talk about a wide variety of personal topics that I find interesting. Wow lore, cocktails, sometimes cars. Uh, but for the next five weeks, it's going to be playing host to the Embrace the Spoilers show that I used to do with Jocelyn Moffat, and I will be doing one more time, once more into the breach, as we spoil the final season of Game of Thrones. And I believe my wife Katie will be joining us as well. So that'll be on the Embrace the Spoilers feed. It's going to be on the R2T2 feed. Wherever you find those shows, go check it out. They're all at amove.tv. That's going to wrap it up for this episode. We'll be back on Thursday. What's the next month? May. Thursday, May 2nd. is when (laughs) We'll be back recording the next episode of Into the Nexus. We're going to miss you. But until then, good luck and have fun. Take care.